Hello, uh, my name is Lisa Petrides, and I, uh, am, I run the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education, uh, and we build uh, OER libraries, and we do professional development, and we do a lot of research around the impact of OER. Hi, um, my name is Tao Emil. I'm a professor at the University of Brasilia. I had the UNESCO Chair in Distance Education, and uh, we had the Open Education Initiative, which is an activist research group for open education. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah, you have it. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So my name is Patrick Paul Walsh. I'm a pro full professor at University College Dublin, but on secondment to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network as Vice President of Education and Director of the SDG Academy. Thank you. Thank you very much, and my name is Stephen Weiber. I'm Director for Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations, which is sort of the global peak organization for libraries of all sorts. Thank you very much. Uh, dear participants, uh, we want to wish you a warm welcome to this session on the transformative role of open educational resources in digital inclusion. We are going to start the session by listening to an opening remark from Mr. Taufik Jalassi, who is the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I am pleased to address you today at the 2023 IGF Forum and the first session of the Open Educational Resources Dynamic Coalition. This year's theme, The Internet We Want, brings together policymakers, experts, civil society, and businesses to tackle the challenges and opportunities in our evolving digital landscape. UNESCO is committed to fostering dialogue and cooperation for a more inclusive, secure, and sustainable internet for all. We envision a digital ecosystem where the internet serves as a powerful tool for learning and open educational resources play a pivotal role to increase access to quality education worldwide. In 2019, UNESCO adopted the recommendation on OER which is a UN normative instrument to support inclusive access to digital learning platforms. Today, we gather in Kyoto, the ancient capital of Japan, to explore the transformative potential of OER in the age of the internet, where information and educational materials are abundant. In alignment with the UN Secretary General's call on our common agenda, UNESCO has been advocating for the adoption of openly licensed digital education tools to be accessible through the Internet. The 2019 OER recommendation guides our efforts towards an open, accessible, and equitable education future. It emphasizes international collaboration for content, capacity, and infrastructure, aligning with the global digital compact principles for an inclusive, open, secure, and shared internet. Central to our discussion is the recognition of digital public goods, especially OER, defined by the UNESCO OER recommendation. The five areas of action, namely capacity building, policy support, inclusive and multilingual quality content, sustainability and international collaboration, form the foundation for accessible online learning platforms benefiting both learners and educators. Digital public goods such as OER drive sustainable models of education, knowledge sharing and innovation, thus contributing to the sustainable development goals, including quality education, access to information and ICT, gender equality and the global partnerships. This session is not only about dialogue, it's a call for action. Digital transformation is rapidly reshaping societies. The platform society is intertwining digital platforms and artificial intelligence. We must navigate data privacy, 
transparency and governance intricacies to effectively harness their potential. We call for all governments, partners and stakeholders to unite to implement the 2019 OER recommendation and other norms that cultivate open and secure spaces for education. As stakeholders, our collective efforts through the OER Dynamic Coalition are crucial in shaping an inclusive, equitable, and digitally empowered future via open educational resources. Your contributions will be invaluable in advancing our shared mission. Dear participants, UNESCO has been actively promoting open educational resources to expand access to quality education worldwide, underlying principles such as openness, accessibility, privacy, and freedom of expression in the digital age. The OER Dynamic Coalition brings together stakeholders from various sectors to build values and principles guiding the development and use of the internet. Let us work together to ensure that the internet remains a force for good advancing human rights and sustainable development. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you uh, to the uh, uh, ADG, the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information at UNESCO for this opening remark in which, among other points, he highlighted that this meeting is about core for action. Uh, we were normally uh, to have Zeynep to present the dynamic coalition. I don't know if Zeynep is online. Zeynep? So far, she's not yet online. So um, we are going to have a series of sessions during which uh, some of our panelists will have shared their experiences they, from uh, the different initiatives in which they are involved in uh, throughout the world. So the, 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 I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Melinda Bandaria uh, to share the experience on a critical role in developing, creating, and reusing, as well as adapting and sharing OER. What skills do teachers need to ensure that the OER used in their courses is inclusive and accessible? Over to you. She's joining us online. Yes. Uh, thank you very much and a good day to everyone. Uh, thank you for having me in this uh, session to share my perspective about OERs and the important role of teachers in making uh, OERs accessible and inclusive. So as introduced, I am Dr. Melinda Bandalaria and I am participating from the Philippines. I'm also full professor and chancellor at the University of the Philippines Open University and appointed as ambassador of open educational resources by the International Council for Open and Distance Education and has been actively involved in the uh, OER Dynamic Coalition of UNESCO. So uh, as to the question, uh, considering that teachers and educators uh, play a critical role in developing, creating, reusing, adopting, and sharing OER, so what, um, what are the skills and knowledge do teachers need to have so that um, we can ensure that OERs that are being used in their courses are inclusive and accessible. As we go through the skills and knowledge, it should also guide us in terms of developing training programs, courses for OERs, especially with the participation of our teachers. So first, teachers need to know who are excluded in the teaching and learning ecosystem and why they are excluded. This knowledge would enable the teachers to put in place mechanisms and implement strategies to address the identified barriers. So in most cases, the barrier has to do with the cost of the learning materials, which using OERs aims to address. The other common barriers include physical challenges like hearing or sight impairment, language, given that most OERs are in English language, and other learners may feel excluded because of disregard to cultural diversity. So considering this, the teacher should have knowledge on the following. First is accessibility guidelines, like for instance, the web content accessibility guideline to make the online platform accessible to various types of learners. 
universal design for learning, the knowledge about it, uh, can guide the teachers on how they can integrate even just the basic principles of universal design for learning to the OERs that they will be using, especially given the nature of the OERs that they can be reduced, then teachers can integrate the basic features of universal design for learning to these uh, OERs. Cultural and linguistic diversity or making the content inclusive. Uh, in one of the studies conducted in Southeast Asia, one of the barriers cited by students on the use of OERs is that they are not available in the local language. So teachers can translate uh, these OERs that they will be using in their courses and make sure that there is respect to cultural diversity, that there's nothing in the content that would be offensive to a specific Thank culture. you, uh, Dr. Melinda. Uh, for your input and for clarifying some of the principles that may actually help teachers to create content that are inclusive. Let me, yeah, thank you. Let me uh, return to Zeynep, who um, informed that she's now online. Uh, Zeynep, can you make a short presentation of the OER Dynamic Coalition before we move forward? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, can you put up the, uh, the slide? Is it possible or not? No? If it's not, it's okay. Um, yes, I'll the give slide. you the slide. PowerPoint slide. Is the, is the second slide. Um, otherwise, it's, I'll just go on. Um, the, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I'm very sorry there's something wrong with the camera and I will try and fix it during the course of the, uh, of the session. Um, I would just like to present to you very quickly the, uh, the OER recommendation 2023, I'm sorry, 2019. Uh, this recommendation was adopted by all member states by consensus in 2019. And it basically has a, a very clear definition of OER which is uh, which is which explains to you exactly what OER is and what it is not, and I will read it out to you right now. Um, the definition is that it's any any learning, teaching, or research material in any format that resides in the public domain or is under a copyright that has been released under an open license that permits no cost access, reuse, repurposing, adaptation, and redistribution by others. And uh, there is a clear also definition of uh, open license. I would invite you to go to the website of UNESCO, look up the name of the uh, OER recommendation 2019 to have the full text. There is five areas of action and we'll be going through each of the areas of action in this presentation. And the first one is capacity building, the second is policy, the third one is on quality, uh, inclusive, multilingual OER, and the fourth is on sustainability, and the fifth one is on international cooperation. And the international cooperation is the basis of this OER recommendation, which bring, of this OER dynamic coalition, which brings together the panel before you. I would just like to also ha point out that the stakeholders in this recommendation are the entire knowledge community. So we have the education community, we have libraries, museums, and we have also publication. Um, you have on your on the screen uh, in the chat, if you're online, you have the text of the recommendation there. We have a very full panel, so I will stop here and give the floor back to you, Michelle, uh, to continue. Uh, thank you, Zeneb. Can we, can we stop the presentation, please? Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I want to check to know if uh, Mr. Papaluga is online. Has he joined us or not? Papa Luga was to share the experience on uh, the how uh, learners can draw from the various uh, cultural, linguistic, and socioeconomic background to create uh, inclusive OER content. Um, if he's not online, then let me check if uh, Ms. Gian Osman, is he online? If not, uh, can I check to make sure that Mr. Nail Butcher is online? Nail? Yes, I am online. Thank you, Nail. 
So, so this gives us the opportunity to move forward with the second part of this uh, presentation, where I'm going to invite uh, uh, Lisa Pritadist to share her uh, experience on OER repository. Uh, Lisa. Yes, thank you. Will the slide be on the screen? Okay, go ahead. But I'll not be able to move forward with this. Great, thank you so much. So I want to talk about really the, the sharing of knowledge and what that means in terms of OER libraries and repositories. Uh, the repository is really the underlying infrastructure of libraries. They're vast and diverse. They're across the world. Um, they contain often metadata description of how content is created and used and adapted, which is extremely important. It's not enough to have uh, platforms where these content reside, but it's equally as important to know, have very um, good descriptions for both the educator as well as the learner who is going to be using these resources. It's not enough just to have a whole library if we don't really understand what's in it and why we might want to use it. Uh, just like the librarian in a, um, in a physical library, that person is probably one of the most important people in terms of their function, in terms of the search and discovery. So similarly, in the online content, we rely on the metadata and often librarians behind the metadata creation to guide, uh, to guide us through that kind of content. I want to just talk about this through the CARE framework, which is something that you can look at careframework.org, because it's what it is is it's, yeah, the CARE framework is 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 a way to show what is good OER stewardship and how to become OER stewards of of OER, and so I thought it might be an interesting way to apply the CARE framework to platform and tools and how they can be designed uh, in a user centric way. So the first part of care, uh, so it's contribution is the C, attribution, release, and empower. So contribution is about advancing the awareness, improvement, and distribution of OER. And what this means specifically in terms of platforms and metadata is that we really have to focus on portability, interoperability, and the ability to adapt or localize. In terms of attribution, we're talking about conspicuous attribution. And what I mean by that is, if we don't know the provenance of the resource, where that resource came from, how it's been used along the way, we really lose the ability to describe and build a transparent knowledge base. And as you heard uh, Zainab talk about in the OER recommendation, what we're trying to create is really a commons, the knowledge commons around OER. The third piece, 30 seconds did you say? No. Uh, release, uh, making sure that the content can be used beyond the platform um, in a way that it requires the platform to be interoperable with others. And last is empower, and perhaps I think one of the most important attributes today is meeting the needs of all learners, including those who have been traditionally excluded. So this requires content that is culturally relevant, inclusive, and accessible to those with disabilities. And again, when we think about the metadata that's describing this content for search and discovery, I think that the CARE framework really um, helps to um, illuminate what those, the, what those factors are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for sharing that on the importance of meta metadata. Uh, and also OER repository. I'm turning now to Stephen to ask about uh, the importance of collaboration, how to make this possible, collaboration between educational stakeholders to support OER initiatives. Thank you very much, Michelle, and, and, and thank you for the invitation to, to be here today. I think just as a, an introductory point, there's a lot of talk at the moment about digital public infrastructures and digital public goods, and OER is such a powerful example of this and is so often overlooked, so it's really important that we're having this, this session here today. Um, so I think at risk of, of repeating Lisa's points, but without an attractive acronym to make sense of them so that everyone can take notes, um, the roles that libraries tend to play, um, often it is, I, know, I think, as you said, <clears throat> 
supporting with I don't know, discovery awareness. And uh, as we know, the fact that something is available on the internet does not necessarily mean that it's actually accessed or used. Um, there's an awful lot of shouting into the void online. And libraries have proven effective in so many cases and actually then updating their original roles of putting people who need knowledge in, uh, in touch with knowledge, raising awareness of the possibilities. I think combating some of the assumptions there are that because OER is free, it's worthless. And there is always this sort of human tendency to believe that unless you've paid for something, it's not worth it. Wrong. <laughs> um, overcoming some of the ideas, some of the prejudices that doubtless exist about OER as resources. Um, I think Lisa's already covered the point about um, curation, but I think curating in a way that responds to need, actually, again, bridging the materials that are out there, the resources that are out there, working with faculty, working out what's actually there. So again, there's that bridging role in there. I think, um, once again, working with educational stakeholders to take a critical overview, and I, I'm conscious, again, I, I risk echoing Lisa in, in this point, that clearly, I know, the landscape of OER that's available right now is, it is primarily from some parts of the world. There's an awful lot coming from the parts of the world that have produced traditional textbooks and traditional materials. But given the training and given the experience they have in trying to evaluate the whole of knowledge that's available, um, librarians can have a really powerful role working with stakeholders to think, well, what's missing? I don't know, what are we not seeing as opposed to what we are seeing? And actually then, once again, working to make sure that we're coming up with OER that fits. Um, I'm going to jump to the last point, but also in that role of encouraging. I think librarians can have a really powerful role too in giving guidance about how do you use rights, what are the options, what are the channels for faculty, for education stakeholders to feel sufficient agency, sufficient empowerment to produce their own, which really does require. So to work with materials that are there, to produce their own materials, to share them, to really actually deepen that knowledge commons. And then I think the final point is, um, please do count on librarians as allies in pushing for legislative and regulatory frameworks that are favorable, that have decent educational exceptions in copyright, so that you're not unnecessarily held back in using materials for educational purposes. It fits within the recommendation, but it's an ongoing fight. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this, uh, sharing this. I'm going to turn to Patrick. Uh, when we are considering stakeholder engagement, I think uh, the private sector can play a key role in this. So Patrick, what, about, what are the strategies that we can put in place to engage the private sector? Yeah, um, so the answer, um, just to say the, the question I've prepared is the broad partnership, which is a partnership between government, academic, libraries, uh, intergovernmental system, and the private sector. So it's the whole, the whole comprehensive partnership. Um, so we have signed, um, or we're working with um, UNESCO, SDSN, and a joint committee to implement the UNESCO OER recommendation. And we have a partnership agreement that we're going to run what's called a open education resource overlay platform or repository um, or journal, whatever way you want to think about it. Um, and basically, it's we want uh, we basically want to have courses submitted to us that we can quality assure and referee that we can put into archives uh, that are properly metadata, open license, etc., quality assured. And then they can be used inappropriately in, the go in government for education and training or corporates or um, schools or academia in, in their courses. Um, and of course, the whole reason for demonstrating this on the SA, for example, if we did it with SDG Academy courses, uh, which are all up on edX, uh, is to really show a community of practice that, you know, how you'd actually do this with, with guidelines and, and kind of uh, uh, playbooks that people could actually apply this, you know, in other contexts. Um, but just to give a sense of the partners and what's going on. So um, one, you know, people should be able to submit their um, LMSs or courses and they'd be refereed, and not just refereed from the point of view of ac academic and science content, but also adherence to, say, UN policy or UN legal frameworks, et cetera. So they're quality assured and published in the normal academic way. When they go into the repositories, 
they will follow fair care and forest principles. So thank you for explaining the care principles. <laughs> but basically, you know, this stuff has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but there has to be, you know, what I call good citizenship or stewardship of it and also good governance of it. Um, you do need quite a lot of ed tech, and I've actually listed all the kind of ed technologies that you'd have to use for this type of, uh, let's call it publication or, or e-publication, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the open journal systems or the way you would do your uh, copyright licensing or the way you would uh, manage your uh, uh, indicators and metadata and, and so on and so forth. Um, but just to give you a sense that, and just two seconds then, so where the partnership comes in though, when we're developing the metadata and how it's archived, we have to talk to the users, and the users are governments who have training in their LMSs, the corporates who have their HR training, the academics who are, and schools who are doing their curriculum and, and their courses, and in a sense, you have to have what we call the diamond engagement. So it's not enough just to do diamond publication, which is free to publish and free to use, but you actually have to work with the curators and then the users to get the whole system working effectively, or else it's not gonna work. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the three of you for this session during which you have shared your experience on how to achieve a multi-stakeholder approach into the development of OER and also on how to engage the different stakeholders in academia, the private sector, um, in uh, the realization of inclusive OER. I'm going to turn to Zeneb for the next uh, session, the next uh, panel, Zeneb. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, we have the pa we have the pleasure now to look at uh, now and forever about sharing uh, sharing resources within within a policy framework and within the framework of sustainability. Our first speaker is Neil Butcher, who is going to look at issues related to national education policies. Ne Neil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, greetings, everyone from Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, as you can see here, I'm focusing on national education policies. Um, I think what we've seen in the world of OER is that sustainability really depends on governments developing and implementing sustainable policies. There's a lot of OER policies. Unfortunately, many of those policies um, exist in paper but are not really being implemented in practice. And I think in the context of uh, the discussions on accessibility today, it's important just to recognize that 15% of people around the world have some form of disability. So governments really are the key agency that are going to be responsible for ensuring that the good ideas that we've heard about in the previous presentations are implemented and sustained and financed. So we've spoken about the importance of content access accessibility, the application of critical principles, uh, the repositories that are available to support web accessibility and so on. And so in the bottom bullets, what I've just tried to unpack is some of the important things that are critical for national policy. And I think that starts with uh, bullet four, which is to develop policies that provide for the understanding and application of open licenses to content and software. This may seem like an obvious point, but if our intellectual property and copyright policies nationally are not providing for and enabling government agencies to use open licenses, then it's unlikely that that will actually ever be done. We also then need in our policy to unpack the meaning of digital accessibility and its practical implications for policy. And, and the practical implications are the important part. There's a lot of lip service to the importance of digital accessibility, but the kinds of ideas you've heard about in the previous slides really need to be documented in, the, in, in policy uh, and, and their implications for content development and other processes that are being funded by governments need to be stated very explicitly. So these explicit requirements about digital accessibility need to be contained in the policy, and they need to be binding in the sense that when governments are spending money on content development, there needs to be an obligation that this is built into uh, what, they, uh, uh, what government agencies are expected to procure. So the accessibility plan for existing national and other, and other education initiatives, the kinds of ideas we've heard about in the previous presentations on the repositories, uh, these initiatives are, are really important, but if government is not committing to sustaining them on an ongoing basis, we're unfortunately not going to see the, the kind of impact that we're looking for and that's been discussed by my colleagues. And so that will bring me to the last point that I consider to be the most important, 
is policies need to be uh, explicitly stating what the accessibility considerations should be for content creation projects, for educational projects, and how those need to be embedded in the procurement processes. So I think this is the key hurdle at which we tend to stumble, is that we have a lot of good principles and ideas often documented in policies or contained in guidelines. But when we get to the point of procurement and when there's urgency to move ahead with, say, procuring a content creation policy for the development of uh, educational materials at national level, unfortunately, the procurement processes don't enforce obligations for the service providers to make sure that their content they're creating adheres to accessibility guidelines and making sure that that's a condition of payment for the services being received. So unfortunately, what tends to happen is the contracts are executed uh, and this critical consideration of accessibility is left at this, on the sidelines. Um, so I would say of all the things that we can do that would be most important, we lead up to this one. If we don't include um, some references to the importance of accessibility and making sure that there is accountability for delivering those, those obligations in the procurement process, all of the other excellent work that we might have done will unfortunately have been for nothing. So I think those are some of the critical guidelines at the national level we need to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Neil. It's a very clear presentation on the national present national policy uh, issues. Um, colleagues, I'd also like just now to ask Melinda Bandeleria to kindly come back to the uh, to the point that was started at the beginning, which was on bringing this national policy into the classroom in terms of institutions. Um, the person, the colleague who's kindly taking care of the slide, if they could go to the second slide, you'll see the slide from Melinda. Melinda, Melinda the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Zainit. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, skills and knowledge that the teachers should have so that they can make OERs uh, more accessible and um, inclusive is uh, should guide should guide the policies uh, and also in developing uh, training programs uh, for teachers. So um, I have mentioned already uh, cultural and linguistic diversity and also uh, the knowledge about copyright laws and licenses that are associated um, with OERs. So. Uh, about the skills that should also be integrated into the uh, uh, training programs for uh, teachers. Of course, teachers should know how to convert their open educational resources materials into alternative formats, such as audio, braille, or even simplified text to cater to students with different needs. They should also have the skills to provide captioning and transcription for hearing impaired learners when reusing OERs and be able to provide descriptive text for hyperlinks and alternative text for images, especially for those who are screen readers. And of course, um, the technological skills will be very handy so that they can make sure that the OER platforms and materials that they are using are compatible with the assistive technology that the learners, different types of learners will have access to. And the most um, probably, uh, we are not very much conscious about this, is uh, for them to determine about the text readability of the materials that they are using and um, uh, knowing how to uh, determine, uh, like using uh, different mechanisms like the FUG index um, measurement. So um, at the end of the day, uh, it is also uh, making use of the technology platforms to make this uh, materials, open educational resources materials. So what I'm trying to um, emphasize here is that our training for teachers should not stop with them developing, sharing, knowing the licenses appropriate for the materials that they are producing, but also acquiring these different knowledge and skills, which are essential to make the open educational resources that they are using more accessible and inclusive to the various types of learners. So I think that's all from my end. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to finish my uh, presentation and contribution to this forum. Good day to everyone. Thank you very much, Melinda. Thank you very much. So there's a very concrete response to policy which is put into action at uh, the national level and at the institutional level. And with that, I'd like to turn the floor now to give the floor now to Michelle. Michelle is a communication information advisor from UNESCO Dakar, and he will talk about a successful example of an OER initiative at a regional level, which can serve as a model of good practice. So Michelle, the floor is yours. Um, I think it's further on. 
Yeah, thank you, Zeneb. Um, as part of our initiative for implementing the OER recommendation in West Africa, we started by conducting uh, research with the different stakeholders, the academia, the teacher training institution, to understand what are the shortcomings that may prevent the adoption of OER. And uh, we came out with some observation that without uh, middle to top level buy-in of the OER, it's going to be difficult for most of the country to actually engage in the implementation of the recommendation. So we, uh, 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 we turn out to uh, raising awareness among decision makers, the Minister of Education, Minister of uh, Youth, and uh, Minister of Havaga Education, and also all the middle decision makers within the education sector and also uh, to uh, explain to them the importance of OER and how OER can actually contribute to quality education within the country. And this led to what? This led to commitment from uh, many of the countries in West Africa to uh, develop a national strategy for uh, OER. So we start with um, Burkina Faso. So we were successful in actually developing with the Ministry of Higher Guy Education a national OER strategy, and that is yet to be validated. You know, the country has been into some uh, troubles, and then this has halted the progress toward the adoption of the OER national strategy. We also succeeded in convincing the Senegal to engage in the uh, elaboration of its own OER strategy. So today, uh, we are working toward the validation of the national strategy. It was a collective effort with multiple stakeholders involved in the design of the strategy. And it's covered all the dimension of the OER, actually contextualizing with uh, the reality of each country. We also made the same thing in Togo, where the country also engaged in the development of uh, the OER strategy, the same thing in Congo, and also in Djibouti. So, so far we have about um, five countries that are in the process of adopting the, the OER national uh, strategy, and all the strategy, what is really interesting is that uh, the very process of the, the elaborating the OER was quite interesting in raising awareness for the recommendation. Because by being involved in the process, many came to have a better understanding on the why and on the importance of the OEI recommendation. So that today, we are having in many of those countries, there are uh, a, a, a team of uh, experts who are uh, becoming the advocate for the OER within the country. The, the, the challenge that we see so far is the challenge of funding. Uh, we have seen that the, the, uh, everywhere where the strategy was developed, there was this concern about how the government is going to actually fund. How are they going to find the resources to actually support the realization of the strategy? And one of the suggestions was that uh, government can actually ensure that from now on, whenever there is a project with donor involving the production of educational resources, government should ensure that at least part of the project support the production of open educational resources within the country. So um, we hope that with that experience, we are, con we are still in the process of the adoption of, the, of the, the OER strategy, but the strategy in all those countries has already been elaborated, but still uh, um, to be validated at the national level. So this is what I can share regarding the experience that we have in West Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you for sharing this uh, this experience in West Africa, which is very, um, very, very uh, strategic. I'd like to give the floor now to Dr. Telemiel, who is the adjunct professor at UNESCO uh, and UNESCO chair in distance education at the University of Brasilia, Brazil, who will talk about sustainability models. Tell the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that we have to worry about based on you know, a couple of presentations that came before is what does it mean to be sustainable for OER? And of course, the, the, the first thing is, is the issue of money, right? Whenever we're funding these kinds of things, just like when we talk about free software, we know that development of free software and development and sustaining of these projects takes money. 
And so there, there are many ways, and I just want to highlight three. One of them is related to what Michelle just mentioned, which is the idea of open procurement. So many governments around the world, uh, one of the, idea, the ideas that we push the most is this idea that if you're, if you're using public funds, you should have you know, public assets, public goods. So open procurement models are, are very popular, but uh, I think they, f they fluctuate quite a bit. I mean, in, in some countries, it's very easy to push the idea of complete open procurement. Everything that you, that you produce with public funds should be open. Uh, in, others, in other countries, we have to be open to the idea that this is, might not work exactly as we expect. You know, we have to be more restrictive on your licenses, or not all resources will be open. In some will and some not. Uh, I like to think of open procurement as a, as a transition, you know, especially if you're, you're going from an all rights reserved model, you have to kind of, you know, to try different ways of making this work until it maybe eventually you'll get complete open procurement. But there are other ways to do this. Uh, well, just like with free software, you, we have models for open with added value. So you might provide the resources for free, which is a key stone of OER. The resources must be free, but then services like customization or training and all these kinds of other things can be can be. Um, uh, by cost, and then also uh, a, a non, uh, non something that doesn't last forever, but but is is good to get things started, particularly in, in new projects, to, whether it's in a government or an institution, is partnerships and donations from foundations. I think people are, are very keen on funding these kinds of uh, of things for openness, but then uh, the the financial aspect is one uh, for OER, particularly there there are two others. Neil mentioned policy, so I'll be very brief on this, but it's not just about putting the policies on paper. We have plenty of those, and, and some are much more effective than others, but one of the things that works really well is having working groups that are cross-sector. We've heard a lot about multi-stakeholders, but actual multi-stakeholders with people actually doing things and representing their coordinates of the world, uh, doing things together and monitoring these policies, that, that works really well in many countries that has worked uh, very, very well. Uh, and, and groups that can evolve, right? So OER is not a, something that stands uh, over you know, in time and as one solid thing, the the, uh, the the entry of generative AI has changed quite a bit our perspective on OER. So we have to have people thinking about this from the perspective of teachers and legal issues and so forth. So these working groups work for that. And finally, uh, OER as it's an educational endeavor. That's the core. Uh, the practices around OER is what really matters. And so if you don't have community engagement, if you don't have people that are buying into this uh, at all levels, it makes absolutely no sense. It's just legislation. It's just money. It's just resources. Right? So we have to have people that have incentives, they have recognition for doing these kinds of things, and then can continuously raise awareness about where OER is at that moment. Thank you very much, Tell. And uh, right now we've been very efficient with our time, so I'd just like to take this opportunity to actually do a meta discussion because in fact, in front of you today on the screen, uh, majority of these colleagues are actually on the advisory board of the OER Dynamic Coalition. And this is the first uh, OER Dynamic Coalition event at the IGF. And we're very all very honored to be here before you. Um, we have uh, in, the IG, in the OER Dynamic Coalition, it was started in 2020. And the principle of uh, the Dynamic Coalition was started in 2020, and we became an official IGF Dynamic Coalition in March 2023. Uh, but the spirit of Dynamic Coalition was in the body of this text from the beginning of the discussions and in the background document to the text of the recommendation, which was presented before the member states. And before you, and in many of the presentations, we have had um, in the uh, Melinda, who is uh, the advisory board chair for um, capacity building, also Lisa, who is uh, for policy, and Tell, who is for sustainability, and um, Neil for communication. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going through the list. Um, uh, you have the different members of the part of the um, of the advisory board, and these uh, the OER Dynamic Coalition has to, has uh, brought together five brings together up to now 500 stakeholders from uh, the different stakeholder groups that were presented at the beginning of the uh, of the of the session: the, the knowledge community, education. Uh, culture and also uh, publications. And we bring together stakeholders from government, institutions and civil society. And it focuses on uh, knowledge sharing and collaboration in the implementation of the recommendation. Uh, 
And uh, this format has turned into a very useful way of maintaining the dialogue and maintaining the discussions and bringing the, dis the issue of the implementation of the OER Dynamic Coalition a priority for governments and uh, institutions to date. And it's a great pleasure to be here before you. Uh, we have some time ahead of us, so I would just like to maybe ask the panel two questions that were in the discussion, but unfortunately we haven't had time to look at it. But I will just perhaps get, put it to the panel for the moment. Um, the first one is how OER can be tailored to diverse needs of learners in terms of cultural, linguistic, and socioeconomic backgrounds, fostering inclusive learning. And this goes to the area of the recommendation which deals with, um, with uh, quality, multilingual, inclusive uh, OER. Could I ask perhaps uh, if there are anybody, uh, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but uh, I will nonetheless do so. I hope you don't mind. Um, could I perhaps give the floor to Lisa to start with? Would that be okay with you, Lisa? Absolutely, Lisa, the... of course. Yeah. Okay, um, you're to the left of Tal, I think. And, and for those of you who don't know, Zainab, who has been running and spearheading this dynamic coalition from the beginning, when she asks us to do something, we do it. So thank you, Zainab. Um, you know, I think the issue, let me just start by saying, you know, OER, as many of us, I think, on this panel here see it, is a public good. And just like air or water, uh, you know, education should be accessible to everybody who wants it, who needs it. And so I think what's been really important in OER is to think of this practice of open education as something that brings uh, education opportunities to not only the mainstream of education, but for those who have been excluded, uh, for those who have left and we want them to come back, to those who uh, are simply have been, um, in some cases, somewhat um, you know, not a part or even in the worst cases, invisible to the processes of education. And we think about places where there, um, you know, where, where there's no uh, school systems that are operating because of war or other situations like this. So when we think about diversity of learners, I think um, the idea that the use of, of open educational resources as a knowledge transfer, as a knowledge building is, uh, quite transformational. We're not just talking about what already happens in our education systems. We're talking about inclusive voices. So in some cases, that's where uh, students themselves are involved in the content creation, uh, where faculty in higher education or teachers in primary schools are using their own cultural context and localization to actually adapt OER. And this is where we're seeing some of the biggest uh, transformational changes in the use of OER, and that uh, is all around the world. I can speak for the US, but for many other parts of the world as well. So um, Zainab, who do you want to have this next? <laughs> does anyone else in the room, does anybody want to say something? Tell, I see you smiling all the way from here in Paris. This is nice. Would you like to add anything? Uh, I was waiting for you to give me the order. Um, <laughs> no, I think that the, w one of the things that we we talk about here, and especially in this in this context of IGF, is this presence of many different cultural groups and many different needs, and we understate the power of OER for doing this. I mean, if if we're talking about public goods, it means including everybody, and one of the greatest strengths of OER is adaptability, is remixability, is being able to share and revise and remix and reuse, which is quite unique. Um, and we don't explore that enough, I think, that uh, especially in this multilateral, multi-stakeholder uh, process of having people really engage with these kinds of resources is, is something that pedagogically makes a lot of sense um, and makes it really a public good, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of handicapped here because I can only see what the screen shows me. So I can only see you up to Michelle, but Michelle, uh, perhaps you can, you can see better than I can. Would someone like to? Paul here. <laughs> um, so um, just what I think is a, is a congratulations to everyone who was part of actually putting together the OER recommendation because it really is a, a wonderful instrument. Um, just to answer your question though, I think what's in the recommendation which is really important is that this kind of freedom to create 
and to contribute to the knowledge, uh, global knowledge commons. That, that's so important. And then we have to even think about people with disabilities. So people in any part of the world should be able to freely and easily contribute uh, to the content. And that's one freedom. The other freedom, obviously, is accessibility. And I really like the previous speaker who talked about the content has to be, like the PowerPoint slides and videos, et cetera, has to be compliant uh, to, to people with visual impairment, et cetera, et cetera. That's very important. But then the key point is that when you use it, you can repur repurpose it, translate it, put it into your local context, put it back into the Global Knowledge Commons again. So it's, it's really so important to keep it decentralized and in decentralized repositories so all that can happen. Um, but that's why I think the, the recommendation is so, um, is so wonderful because you might just think, oh yeah, free education resources, but it, it's not about that. It's actually about how they're created, how they're accessed, how they're repurposed. So there's much more to this than just what it looks like uh, OER. And Stephen would like to contribute, if that's okay. So sure, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, <coughs> at risk of just re-emphasizing a couple of points so far, I think... Uh, I want to draw f firstly on on what what Paul was saying about the knowledge commons and actually Edna, th this is it's an idea that was very strongly brought out in the Futures of Education report a couple of years ago about this idea of trying to move away from a sort of single direction model of you shall learn this body of knowledge and that is what you shall learn to a much more sort of recurring circular approach where you learn you explore you contribute you improve and, and that, I know, that's quite a radical thing, it feels like, but actually making that clear that that's the model that we're going for is, is a significant one because it does create agency and it creates responsibility. And the other thing I wanted to pick up on, something that Paul said about diamond engagement and this idea that it's not just at the producer side, but also it's important to have people therefore on the ground whose responsibility is not just to make sure that the stuff gets on the internet in the first place, but then that the stuff is taken down and used. And, and of course, I don't know, that's logically a role that obviously teaching staff have, but librarians in particular have, in accepting that, I don't know, we can't just assume that if we shout up to the internet, someone will actually make use of the stuff and, and, and it'll actually work. I don't know, we can't have a supply side only approach here. We need to have a demand side approach. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any other inputs in the thing. Neil has raised his hand. Neil, two people have raised their hands. Neil, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Zenith. Uh, maybe just to build on what previous colleagues have said, I think one of the things that I could emphasize possibly is just the importance of making sure that, that we don't necessarily think that more is better um, and, and that we've, we focus collectively on ensuring that the way in which we invest resources has a very strong focus on producing high quality teaching and learning mm -hmm. resources and, and OER um, for accessibility purposes. I, I think very often we have a very technical way of thinking about that when we do engage in accessibility. So, so we just take materials and, and make them accessible at that technical level. But we're not actually considering whether or not the quality of the teaching and learning materials justified making them accessible in the first place. The, the internet is flooded with content, uh, and the more flooded it becomes, the more I think that carefully curated collections of resources um, that, that we can feel confidence um, are, are encapsulating high quality teaching and learning experiences of the kind that, that we just heard about. Stephen gave some really good examples, I think, of how that might look in practice. Um, we just need to make sure that we take the time to invest properly in what we're doing and not just rush the process of, of taking a whole lot of content and making it accessible. Um, I, I think that's doing a disservice to learners rather than helping them in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much. Melinda, would you like to yeah. add anything? Yeah, I just would like to support uh, the points raised by Neil and saying that uh, uh, we may, we have to make sure that what we are using are quality OERs. So it is very important that we have this quality assurance framework, which we can integrate in evaluating the open educational resources that uh, especially the teachers are using for their uh, courses. So that's one point. 
um, and the important role of the teachers, the important role of the universities uh, in making sure that these OERs, that's what what's being circulated in the web, in the internet, are quality materials that are being reused, remixed, translated into the local languages and shared alike uh, by, by the teachers, by the universities who are into it. And of course, the, the, the more important thing is uh, putting in place the policies that will support or provide um, the conducive environment for the OERs, the use, the development, and sharing of OERs to flourish. So if it is not possible for um, a national policy to be there immediately, then probably institutional policies uh, can start the work, can, um, can, 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 can do the work, and um, make sure that uh, we have these things uh, or the five action areas on the OER recommendations can be undertaken. So uh, role of universities and policies, even at the institutional level and then the national level policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have uh, from the participants in the room and online, would anybody like to add anything? Um, it's a, it's a very funny thing to um, to have uh, moderation online and in the room because you you can only see so many I see now only Melinda's face but I'm sure there's a lot of people behind Melinda but I can't see them so um, uh, in that case if we have some time left and I would yes. just like to ask Yes, yes, we have uh, one person in the room. Yes, for thank a question. you. Yeah. yeah, it's a question, exactly. Niels Brock, uh, DW Academy. My question uh, was about the experience with a decentralized repository. So I would be interested if there are any best practices that some of you could share about this. Uh, and maybe also uh, specific kind like open technologies for this. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the basic idea. Um, you know, uh, ironically, I think a lot of universities who are engaged in getting up the rankings on, let's say, commercial or branded journals, right, they want citations. That's part of, you know, impact factors. It's part of the whole reason why you get ranked as a university. But ironically, the way to gain citations or to get a citation mm -hmm. dividend is to make sure that on your research portal or your profile that actually you link a preprint or an open paper in some way uh, to the actual citation, because that will actually, if you put it in the repository, the local repository in your local library, you know, it's it's more findable, and you know, you put in a keyword, and people come to you. They don't have to go to the brand journal; they come to you through the search engines, right? Um, and if your metadata is really good, they'll find you uh, really easily, right? And then, of course, they'll they'll read your preprint, but they'll actually cite your actual publication. And seemingly, the citation dividend across different disciplines is enormous. Right? So there is actually quite a bit of work you know, on let's call these learning objects like PDFs to put into repositories. Okay? Um, so what I'm talking about here though is that I know particularly during COVID that on our LMSs we all have kind of folders of, of, of digital objects. You know what I mean? Like videos and homeworks and, 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 and so on and so forth. And the idea is that if you standardize how that LMS is structured, and that also can be archived in a local repository, right? That you're able to, again, uh, you know, through platforms uh, to actually point. So, so for example, eLife do it for biology and they have a, it's an overlay of repositories of the, of the researchers and they publish their papers. So the idea of our platform would be actually to highlight uh, LMS folders that you could just click, go to a repository, and then you can pull it up into your own LMS, right? This is basically the idea, and it's a network of learning objects, you know, multimedia kind of uh, learning object, right? But the real benefit to doing it decentralized, and, and it's actually because of Elsevier Science and these, I think that the libraries are, for interlibrary loans, and they're, they're interoperable. The repositories are so interoperable because actually, if they're actually building it for doing all this work of hosting and archiving for the commercial entities, right? So the academics create the work and sign the, over the property, right? And then they sell that back to the library. And then the libraries do all the work in archiving and for preservation and other, this is ridiculous, right? So we have to try and get rid of the middle person and entity, and we have to try and just work librarians, academics, and others just to work together to make that, make that happen, right? Um, 
uh, which, what was the point I was trying to make was, um, I, I've, I've lost the point, but uh, the decentralized <laughs> system, you're, you're getting the, oh yeah, the key thing is that you can update your, your course locally. You can repurpose it locally, or like others can take it, translate it, put it back into the system again, right? So in other words, rather than just giving away your property right, giving away a PDF that you can't edit, that goes you know, into a library system that you can't edit, that's just nonsense as well, right? We should be able to update uh, what's in our repository. So my course, I might change 10% every five years, you know. Um, but you see the idea that you would update it and, and that it becomes a kind of a, a real-time uh, repository rather than something like, you know, 2005 publication in Nature or something, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Any other uh, question from the room or online? Any comment, contribution? Uh, I just want to... Uh, following just uh, what uh, Amel has said about the open uh, government procurement, uh, what we have learned from the context of West Africa, and this was a great surprise for us, is that um, we discovered that in many of the countries with whom we were working, ha they have no budget for educational resources production. Hmm. No budget. So um, uh, the idea of open procurement doesn't fit in that context. So we had to, uh, as part of the OER strategy, to raise awareness on the importance for the government to actually engage in the production of educational resources, adaptation and remixing, uh, supporting initiative related to this. So um, we should not take for granted that uh, countries uh, are already are committed to produce uh, educational resources. It's not the case. And we have this, and I'm saying all the five countries with whom we were working, they have no budget, no budget line to produce educational resources. Not, I'm not talking about open education, but educational resources. They have no budget line. So this is a, a, a key challenge in, 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 in such context and the importance of raising awareness of the importance of a country to actually engage in the production of educational resources here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for making that comment. I think that if we think of the origins of sort of the teaching profession, that the teacher or educator was the person with the internal knowledge. And over time, we've developed a system where, in fact, there are experts out there, all the way to the textbook publishing company, and this whole industry has started, and this is where the money and the procurement happens. But in fact, the native knowledge is around the educator, and it's also around the learner who is living, breathing, working in a community with a lot of knowledge and understanding. I mean, we found early on when we were going to certain places to talk about OER, people were seeing what we had done in our library, OER Commons, and they would say, that's nice, but we have oral histories here, or we have other native or indigenous you know, languages here. Um, the knowledge is there, and if we think about having, it, it's sort of rethinking what teaching means and who teachers are and how teachers are trained, but we've gotten so far away from the idea where the educator is actually the expert in, in their knowledge. And that might be some kind of perspective, you know, that, that is brought there as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, it, this was a very insightful exchange. You know, at the beginning of this uh, panel, the Assistant Director uh, General for UNESCO uh, invite us to use the opportunity of this discussion to lay out key actions to uh, undertake in order to advance the agenda of OER recommendation. So I'm going to turn to each of you. Let's say two minutes. Uh, okay, three minutes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what is the takeaway and what are core action that we need to consider for the future of the implementation of OER. I'll start with Emil. So I, I think based on the experience that we've had in Brazil for like 10 years developing policy on this is uh, give people serious responsibilities for OER, you know, make, it, make it a serious uh, element and, and give them the responsibility uh, to, to do it um, and expect things to happen from people. So um, create the policies, get people involved and then give them 
serious responsibilities for taking care that it's going to be implemented. Uh, without that, I think that if we don't have people actually involved in this and around this with the incentives to stay, uh, it just becomes another piece of legislation that doesn't move forward. It's an, an agenda item that people talk about, but never nothing ever happens around it. So that would be, the I think, the biggest takeaway for me. Thank you. Stefan? So <clears throat> I think I'd probably underline, and, and this is probably sort of a, a, a takeaway recommendation for, for the sector I represent, um, the importance of making it, trying to get ourselves to the same stage with OERs as we are with open access. And you know, a point I, I would have made to the colleague from DW Academy is that there's already a lot of really good work around how do you get into operability to happen between OA repositories through organizations like COAR in, in, in Canada. Can we apply that same logic to OER repositories? And then just come back to the question you were actually asking me now, how do, we ma no, how do we mainstream? How do we do an end run <laughs> around the development process here and, and make sure that librarians are seeing in just the same way as they provide materials that they really feel confident and they feel responsible for helping their faculty, for helping students make the most of OER so that they feel agency in order to help other people feel agency. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my key takeaways, of course, I'm very much focused on uh, capability building as one of the uh, action areas in the OER recommendation. So uh, initially, uh, we were so much focused on the just uh, uh, raising awareness, uh, ability to use and develop and share OERs. But this uh, discussion uh, really uh, brought us back to the essentials of making OERs more inclusive and accessible. So we have to go beyond. Um, in this capability building initiatives. And of course, uh, I just would like to go back uh, to what was also contained in the OER recommendation. And um, it will also uh, bring us to that, I, to that um, discussion on the lack of resources to produce OERs. And uh, part of the OER recommendation is uh, invoking uh, that the, the, the public funds uh, can be used to produce um, OERs. And if we use uh, the public funds to produce these educational resources, then uh, we are morally obliged to make them open uh, access materials. So I guess um, this is something that uh, we should be doing, uh, our advocacy, our commitment uh, to making uh, OERs more, uh, more, more popular in terms of use and development. And uh, the incentive system, uh, especially for universities, that's the sector I am representing, uh, incentive system for the faculty members, for the teachers, uh, when they use um, and create and share open educational resources to the community. So that, that, these are my key takeaways from this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Lisa? Thank you. Um, I have three quick things. Uh, one would be to uh, resist this urge for strategies where one size fits all. Uh, I think the comment about decentralization was key, and we have to really keep uh, working on that and what that really means to have localized control of knowledge. Yet, in a decentralized model, it filters up in a way where we really do build this knowledge commons. The second piece is to not be seduced by the commercial uh, private partnerships that are becoming much in vogue today. Um, they're wrought with a lot of internal problems uh, that ultimately I, I fear will uh, result in the locking up of knowledge, not to mention there are so many privacy concerns or, uh, once you have commercial interests in terms of how data is used, who uses it, and data for whom. And the third one is a real positive, uh, a positive recommendation or takeaway, which is we really need to build bridges across open. That's open educational resources, open pedagogy, open data, open science, uh, open access, open publishing. Did I miss any of the opens? Uh, I think uh, we've been operating in silos for too long, and we really need to start connecting those for, for real. Thank you. Um, Patrick? Yeah, so I, I fully endorse just what Lisa said. Excellent. Um, so just to, to just to come back to um, like so my big thing, and of course I'm gung ho to implement this uh, this uh, overlay repository or journal of, of SDG courses. But 
Um, I guess the thing that keeps me awake at night is behavioral issues, as I call them, or psychology. So in other words, just to take an example of one of the stakeholders is the government, right? So you have to change the mindset. So what's the problem there, right? So Jeffrey Sachs was discussing our project at uh, the TESS, you know, the Transforming Education Summit, and I think he said something very important, right? So he said the reality here is that there's a, a, a bit of a sunk cost to set this up. So I'm an economist, so there's sunk costs and there's marginal costs, right? So think of putting in electricity or a digital infrastructure, you know what I mean? Like to set up the power points, to, to put in the railway tracks, to put in the ports. No individual can really do that. That has to be done by government. So there is a bit of a sunk cost to get this up and running. The beauty of it, though, is that the marginal costs are very low. And in fact, uh, once it's open, as um, Telemia was saying, you know, there is possibilities to add, add kind of value or commercialization, which would actually pay into the resource. So I could put sums together for the government saying, if you put up so much money and you put it into your policies and procurement, I can guarantee you within five or six years, the costs to librarians, to the academics, to everyone was going to be way reduced, the marginal cost. And in fact, if any of these uh, global knowledge commons issues are commercialized in any way, your property right will actually accrue income or accrue value added. Um, so I can create a business model. The problem for that, though, is you're saying to the government, you put money up now and change your policies, and then later you're going to get a return. And that doesn't sit well with government, <laughs> right? Because they, too many times have they given money for a, a return in the future, and they've never got the return in the future, right? Um, now, I could go on in terms of what are the incentives for academics? What are the incentives for librarians for interoperability of ed tech, interoperability of all the open opens, um, and so on? So this kind of, so to me, the problem is mindset and, and coherence and uh, cooperation, um, and it's not necessarily um, financial or technical or, or anything like that. It's a real, uh, what I call behavioral uh, mindset issue that you have to address, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nail, are you online? Nail? Um, thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. I think the, the two key takeaways that I'd like to just re-emphasize is, uh, first of all, to recognize Notwithstanding nice conversations about how we should support the private sector in monetizing this space, um, I'm not sure I agree with a lot of that. I think we have to recognize that the responsibility sits squarely with government to make sure that public education systems are accessible for all. Um, and, and that involves proper investment in creating learning environments that actually support real accessibility. Um, and the second takeaway for me re related to that is that the investment strategy for that has to ensure uh, the quality of the teaching and learning experience for everyone. I, I think if OER as a public good is simply expanding access to poor quality learning experiences for people at the margins, it's doing the world a, a disservice, and we need to make sure that the emphasis is very strongly on, on improving the quality of the learning experiences. I would just add one last and, and possibly obvious point, which is that the only way in which we can ensure that this happens successfully is to make sure uh, that the processes by which this all takes place are actually led by representatives uh, from, the, from, from the target communities of learners that we are aiming at. Uh, and I think if, if we look around the panel, certainly at this stage, I think it's clear that, that we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we bring in the voices of the people who we hope will benefit from these conversations. So I think that's another critical challenge that we face as we move forward. Yes. So Niall, just, just so hopefully we're on the same uh, page. So I'm not saying you should uh, commercialize the infrastructure or the content or anything like that. So this is a point about value added. So for example, if a private school takes the material, puts a letter book on it, um, you know, adds things and then sells it out there that they should really, if they're bringing in income, they should be some uh, rent sharing on a, on a public resource, right? Or if a commercial company takes it and actually is doing kind of upskilling and training and again is charging money uh, to do that, that there should be, uh, there should be kind of rent sharing. So it's commercialization on the margin, if you like, but it's not on the infrastructure or the open education resource at all. That has to be publicly owned or stakeholder owned, as you say. 
Um, so I hope that's okay. And you mightn't like the idea of the value added either, but just to be clear that it's not commercialization of the platform or the actual resource. Thank you. Uh, Zenet, do you have one last comment? Zenet? Actually, it's on mute. Zenep? Oh. She's online. I, I think that she's online. Zenep? Oh. I don't know what technical issue. I want to express our a uh, warm uh, thank to all the panelists and all the participants to this session, those who join us from, from online and those uh, are present here in Kyoto. Uh, can we give a, a round of applause to all our panelists and the participants, please. <laughs> thank you very much. Yep. Yes, Zeneb? Yes, it works. Okay, sorry. It's been a bad, bad technology morning. Um, Thank you so much. I was saying that it takes a village to raise a child, they say, but it takes a whole world to make learning possible. And it's, uh, it's through open educational resources that I think the knowledge can really be shared. The point of this recommendation and the point of this panel, the point of this discussion is about sharing knowledge openly. And uh, I'd also like to thank very much all the panelists here and online um, just to let you know, the, uh, the colleagues that are joining us online were coming from three different continents right now into your room. And it is a great pleasure to be here. We would all very much like to be there in person, but unfortunately it hasn't been possible. But thank you very much to all of them. Thank you, Zeneb, and have a great day to all of us. Thanks. Yeah.